Hello and welcome to the GCN Racing News Show. On the show this week, we have climbers going to Roubaix, pros going in search of altitude, Sean Yates is back, and we have a virtual Tour de France. So despite Paris-Roubaix clashing with two Grand Tours this coming season, one of the world's best climbers has announced he will take part in the Cobble Classic. Announcing via French news outlet Le Telegram, Barguil confirmed he will take part in Paris-Roubaix and switch up his programme in the coming season. Now, maybe it's a good idea. It's a lifelong ambition for Barguil to take part in the race. And also, and rather strangely this year, due to obvious current circumstances, Paris-Roubaix will take place after the Tour de France. So it means Barguil can focus on the Tour de France and then go on to maybe experiment a little bit with his race programme. He'll also take part in Flèche Wallon, Liège Baston Liège, and Amstel Gold in the build up to the Queen of the Classics. Good luck to Warren, we wish him all the best, and we hope he has a good race because it's one he always wanted to take part in. And it'll be interesting to see how he gets on, even if it is a race that isn't quite suited to him. Sean Yates has announced he'll be making a return to team staff, taking on a coaching role with the Nippo Delco One Provence team down in the south of France. The legendary ex-pro turned director sportive Supremo has been away from the racing circles for a while now, with his last role being at Team Saxo Bank in 2016. However, he will bring a wealth of experience to the French squad, having taken Wiggins to his 2012 Tour de France win as a director sportive, and we wish him all the best. Pogacar won the Slovenian TT Championships over the weekend, beating Primoz Roglic by just over eight seconds, over a 15.7 kilometer course, with around 800 meters altitude gain. So it's basically up a mountain, wasn't it? But interestingly, Pogacar used a road bike in the first half of the race, where the gradients of the climb were steeper, and he then changed to a TT bike to finish off the time job. But perhaps even more interestingly, is that Pogacar actually did 6.3 watts a kilo on these steep ramps for around 20 minutes, which is rather impressive. Now Roglic, on the other hand, used a time trial bike for the whole race. It's a big win for Pogacar, beating Roglic on what is perhaps his preferred terrain and speciality. And I think it's a big win as well, not just in terms of physical performance, but also in terms of the maturity of his tactics employed to win the national time trial. Bulls Dolmans have announced the signing of young British rider Anna Shackley. The 19-year-old is current British points racing champion on the track and hopes to develop into a climbing talent with the Women's World Tour squad. It's a big move for the young rider, but it could serve her really well. She signed for two years and the team will actually be known as SD Works Cycling Team during her contract period. Bit of science for you now and a study by Inigo Sam Milan, Director of Performance at UAE Team Emirates in conjunction with the University of Colorado found that pro cyclists have a long-term physiological adaption which helps them cope and reduce the build-up of lactate acid in the muscles. Which we think is a great find, to be honest, and something that us ex-racers, GCM presenters, have always made the most of once our careers ended, really. As Dan mentioned last week, Black Cyclist Network have set up a fundraiser with the aim of starting a 10-rider British-based domestic racing team made up of BAME riders. And also, they will have a beginner outreach program attached to the team. And in the space of just a week, they've met their fundraising target, which we think is great news. Good luck, and I'm looking forward to following the team avidly. And that fundraiser is still going, so if you still want to donate, you can find the link in the description below this video. Now the season is really getting close and teams have begun announcing their Tour de France selections. Lotto Soudal have announced that they will be taking Philippe Gilbert, Caleb Ewan, Tim Wellens, Thomas de Ghent, Jan Dergenkolb, Jasper de Boost, Roger Kluger and young tour debutant Steph Crass. It looks like a team that's made for stage wins, if you ask me, with a combination of Caleb Ewan and Roger Kluger in the sprints, and then the trio of Philippe Gilbert, Tim Wellens and Thomas de Ghent going for those opportunistic stage wins that they have become all so famous for. And I think, you know, the team could potentially rack up a high amount of stage wins as a result, especially due to the fact that they don't have the pressure of going for a GC ambition. 
Quick updates on the racing calendar now, and sadly, the Japan Cup has been cancelled this year. The Dutch Cycling Federation, though, is hopeful that there might be an earlier start to racing than previously expected, with restrictions being lifted earlier than previously thought. However, unfortunately, the Tour de Yorkshire looks like it might be in trouble. The race is hoping to find £1.4 million sterling so that the men's and women's races can continue. And well, it will be a travesty if we lose such an amazing race on the calendar. So we cross our fingers for the Tour de Yorkshire. The Tour of Poland will go ahead this year. And in a mark of respect to commemorate the life of Bjorg Lambrecht, a minute silence will be held before the start of every stage. And also Bjorg's number 143 from last year's race will be forever withdrawn from the Tour of Poland. And also a special young riders jersey will be created as a new classification. A thoughtful gesture to a rider who was taken from our sport far too soon. And with the race season around the corner, it seems that pro riders are fighting to get back racing. With the Pro Comes Grot Prix the Mark Sport getting over 400 entries from different professionals. Now, normally in a race like this, a Pro Comes, a pro can turn up, sign on, on the line. I think it was like three euros or something when I was racing, and then you can start in the race. But to get 400 entries is kind of a little bit unheard of. Normally you'd get maybe 100 to 150 riders in the race, and they wouldn't all be professionals, actually. So 400 is a rather big number. And it's left the organizers in a bit of a pickle because they can only select 175 riders. So they're gonna to have to be very selective. And I think that race is gonna be very, very competitive. So I have to keep an eye on that one. Which got me thinking, if 400 riders sounds like a lot, it's because it is. Due to UCI rules, the maximum amount of riders in a Grand Tour has only ever been just above 200. However, in the one day monuments, the rules have been a little less strict. The highest number of riders in one of those came in the 1987 Milan San Remo when Eric Mele took the win. And there were 273 riders on the start line in that edition. Whew, that is one long line of riders, isn't it? Wouldn't like to be at the back when the crosswinds hit. But if we move away from the top level of the sport and move away from the rules which govern the top level of the sport through the UCI, well, there is a little bit of a different story. The numbers are, well, <laughs> absolutely bananas. A race, the Cape Town Cycle Tour, holds the Guinness World Record for the largest amount of participants in one race. In 2004, there was a quite incredible 42,614 participants in the 109 kilometer race, with 32,219 classified finishers. Oh, that's crazy, isn't it? Quite regularly, the race gets over 35,000 participants, and there's been a number of top pros take part as too, such as Russell Downing, Alan Davis, and Robbie Hunter having won editions in the past with Ashley Mulman Peixo having won the women's event in the past as well. Some good news now, and we will see live racing on the channel this July. This weekend, we will see the start of the virtual Tour de France. ASO have teamed up with Zwift to put on the event for both men's and women's teams. There'll be six stages over the first three weekends of July. It's been a big project, with Zwift even creating a whole new world within the game that's simply called France. Froome, Bernal, Van Avermaet, Voss and Van der Breggen are all some of the big names who will be taking part. Unfortunately, due to rights issues, we are only allowed to broadcast the events in certain countries. But if you are in those countries, you'll be able to watch the race free of charge on the GCN app or on the GCN Racing YouTube or Facebook channels. Now with the COVID-19 epidemic making travel even more difficult, pros have had to adapt and find new ways to get those all-important altitude training camps in, with Mount Teed in Tenerife being even more difficult to get to. Ineos have been training at Isola 2000, a ski resort in the mountains behind Monaco, and it's actually only a 90-minute driveway and a stunning place to ride your bike. 
Kiwakowski, Chris Froome, Giant Thomas, Pavel Sivakov, and Dylan Van Baal have all been making the most of a trip to the mountains. And Kiwakowski, speaking to Polish cycling website Rowery.org, said that he spent most of lockdown in an altitude tent. So I guess what else do you do if you're a pro when lockdown hits other than buy an altitude tent, get inside, and patiently wait to be let out? Greg Van Avermaet has been altitude training in Lavinio in the Italian Alps, and he will then drive to Strada Bianca to limit travel after his training camp. Julian Alaphilippe has been up in the French Alps, although we think Belgium classic specialist Yves Lampard has got the right attitude to altitude training. But what about the Colombians? I mean, they've spent the entire lockdown at altitude. And so too has one Swiss rider, Simon Pellois, who spent two years at World Tour with I Am Cycling, and now finds himself riding for Gianni Savio's squad, Androni Drecotti Sidamek. I caught up with Simon to find out how his Colombian training went during lockdown. At the beginning, we had to stay like over two months, like, uh, yeah at home like uh, it was really complicated and then uh, it, it wasn't easy either to get the the the, um, the permission to to train outside like we were just like a 100 rider to be allowed to train outside all just the pro the pro riders in colombia and uh, as i'm not uh, colombian i had to fight a little bit for my for my permission but now it's uh, now it's all good and um, yeah, uh, people are training really hard down there. The Colombian rider, they're, they're training like like crazy. <laughs> really? Do you think it's yeah. going to be an advantage for them? Because obviously you're all at altitude, so you think yeah, it could be an advantage? True. But uh, I mean, a lot of people here are also in altitude and a lot of riders are now in training camp and so on. So I don't know if it's a real advantage. I know that uh, a lot of of, uh, Colombia, of the Colombian rider will have... Uh, I would have traveled a little earlier if they would have the possibility, but now uh, I think they are like in training camp uh, at home, and it's also important before like a short but intense period of uh, racing there. Yeah, yeah. And was it hard to get out of Colombia back to Europe? Was it was it difficult? Yeah, I, I mean, without my my red passport, it would have been impossible. And uh, really. Yeah, yeah, no, because I took a like humanitarian flight to to travel back, and uh, I mean the country is, is closed, and uh, there is no way out, and uh, yeah, it was like a really long trip for me, like over three days of of travel, and uh, <laughs> but now I'm home, and that's the most important thing. In this week's poll, we'd like to know: Would you wear pro team kit out on the bike? We'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on this one, as there can be a bit of a stigma attached to wearing pro team kit. My dad actually wears all my old kit, so if you see the old man out on the roads on the bike in Irish National Champs kit, then yeah, that'll probably be him. You can find a link now to that app poll on the screen now, so please get voting. Dan and Sai will actually be discussing the topic on the GCN show tomorrow, and I think it'll be a really interesting debate. But anyway, that's it for this week's show. Thank you very much for watching. And guess what? It's only less than a month until racing begins. Finally. Right. We're getting there. See you all soon. Yeah. <laughs>